Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, Alice Bryant will have this week's lesson in Everyday Grammar. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first, once a month, Abdullah waits near Cairo's infamous Torah prison for hours. He stands under the hot Egyptian sun for a chance to see his father. In five years, he has seen Egypt's most famous prisoner, former President Mohamed Morsi, only three times. Morsi, an Islamist, served one year in office. His term ended with a military ouster in 2013. His son Abdullah told the Associated Press, I won't sit on the ground while I wait. It's not dignified. I know they will deny my request, but I still have to try. Morsi's family is working to see the former president more often. Since the ouster, he has appeared only in court, where he usually stands in a large, soundproof structure. The family says the 67-year-old Morsi is suffering from poor health because of conditions in the prison. He has spent years alone in his jail room. Last month, the family was given permission for a police-supervised 25-minute visit. It was only the third time family members have seen him since his detention. Abdullah Morsi said, he has no idea what's going on in the country since he was arrested. They don't allow him newspapers or even a pen and paper to write down his thoughts. He added that his father sleeps on the floor and needs medical attention for health problems, including high blood pressure. Abdullah Morsi studies finance, but says he has little chance of finding work in Egypt. Most businesses are afraid to employ him, or they ask for approval from state security. He has no passport, only an identity document. He asked for a driver's permit, but was refused. The court recently sentenced his older brother, Osama, to 10 years in prison in a trial that Amnesty International denounced as a mockery of justice. He and the others who were accused were found guilty of inciting violence at a pro-Morsi demonstration. Police attacked the crowd and killed hundreds of protesters. The Egyptian government has put most of his family on a terrorism watch list and banned them from public life. As a result, the campaign to improve Morsi's prison conditions is now organized from London, where some important British politicians have voiced support. Abdullah said of his father, I am not fighting for anything here except for his rights. Mohamed Morsi won Egypt's first and possibly only pre-presidential election in 2012. A year later, he was overthrown by his own defense minister, now President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi. Morsi is not permitted to speak publicly and has only seen his lawyers four times. In Egypt, prisoners are usually given permission for family visits, but they can be denied at any time. 
This appears to be what happened to Morsi. His family has not been given any official information. During his year in office, Morsi's opponents accused the Muslim Brotherhood of trying to use election victories to control the state. Morsi used his presidential powers to force policy changes in Egypt, but could not get control of the courts and police. Finally, his opponents launched large demonstrations against him until El Sisi came to power. Since then, the government has declared the Brotherhood a terrorist organization and worked hard to destroy it. Tens of thousands of Egyptians have been arrested since 2013. Most have been accused of working with or for the Brotherhood, says the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. The group is based in the United States. Morsi still considers himself Egypt's rightful president. He does not recognize the charges against him, which include treason and incitement to violence. He has been sentenced to 20 years after being found guilty of ordering Brotherhood members to stop a protest against him, which resulted in deaths. An earlier death sentence was overturned. He faces additional charges. Morsi is held in a special area of the Torah Detention Center. Rights groups say its conditions are far worse than those in other jails, both in Egypt and around the world. Egyptian officials deny mistreating prisoners. The government has called the Brotherhood a terrorist organization. Officials have even tried to link it to a group allied with the Islamic State. Abdullah said, The terrorism claims that's all theater. It's the only way they can explain what they did to my father. The United States and Europe have all but accepted El Sisi's state security and done little to criticize operations against the opposition. Instead, they have called him an important partner in the Middle East and sold his country arms. El Sisi won re-election this year in a race without serious competitors. Abdullah and his family want Morsi to be treated more like longtime Egyptian leader Hosni Mubarak, who never went to prison. Mubarak was held in a military hospital. After several trials, he was freed last year. Abdullah said, When my father was in charge, Mubarak was never held in such conditions. My father respected human rights. He added that his father wants only the same treatment as Mubarak. Like many languages, English is constantly changing. And today, it is changing faster than ever. Mobile phones, social media, increased travel, and other things have connected the world more closely and changed how we speak and write. The changes are happening so quickly that English dictionaries now add hundreds of words and phrases every year. And just as these things change, so too do grammar rules. 
In an earlier Everyday Grammar program, we told you about a few grammar rules that are dying. Today, we will tell you about three rules that some experts say are outdated and never had strong reasoning behind them. Breaking these rules is acceptable in all but the most formal writing, such as business letters and some kinds of academic writing. We will begin with one of the most common rules. Number one, never split an infinitive. Generations of English speakers have been taught that it is wrong to split an infinitive. But today, even respected dictionaries, such as the Oxford English Dictionary, say there is no worthy defense for the rule. Infinitives are the unchanged forms of verbs. You can identify one by the word to in front of a verb. For example, to have, to go, and to make are all infinitives. Split infinitives happen when we put an adverb in the middle. Here's an example. He began to flatly deny the abuse charges. In this sentence, the infinitive to deny is separated by the adverb flatly and it sounds very natural. But when you use the no split infinitives rule, the adverb can go in two places, either before the infinitive, he began flatly to deny the abuse charges, or at the end of the sentence. He began to deny the abuse charges flatly. While the first example sounds fine, the second is mechanical and feels unnatural. Patricia O'Connor is a former New York Times book review editor and writes about English. In her book, Woe is I, she writes that the rule on split infinitives comes from a famous 1864 British grammar book that tried to apply rules of Latin to English. Today, even the writing style guidebooks of large media agencies reject this old-fashioned grammar rule. So, unless you have a teacher or employer who has banned split infinitives, this is a rule you can dismiss. Number two, never begin a sentence with a conjunction. The words and, but, and, or come from a group of words called coordinating conjunctions. These words connect two or more structures, such as sentences or clauses. For example, I washed the car and I took the dog for a walk connects two complete sentences. So, technically, you can break these into separate sentences. I washed the car, period, and I took the dog for a walk. Many grammar books and teachers teach you that you should not begin a sentence with and, but, or, or. But surely you've noticed that here at VOA Learning English, we break this old rule a lot. And we are not alone. Many other news agencies, books, websites, and other media break the rule. In his book, The Story of English in 100 Words, linguist David Crystal says that writers have begun sentences with and and but since the 16th century, including William Shakespeare. He explains the rule's unusual history. During the 19th century, some school teachers took against the practice of beginning a sentence with a word like but or and because they noticed the way young children overused them in their writing. Yet, instead of limiting usage, Crystal says, teachers banned conjunctions for opening sentences. This has had a lasting effect, creating the idea that sentences beginning with these conjunctions are incomplete. 
That is untrue. However, if you are going to break the rule, find out if your school or job permits it. In addition, you must do it correctly, which means know what a complete sentence is. For instance, and it's good is a complete sentence. It has a subject and predicate, but and is good is not. It's missing a subject. Lastly, don't start sentences with these conjunctions too often. It can become tiresome for your reader. Now, on to our third rule. Number three, use each other for two and one another for more than two. Traditionally, we have been taught that each other refers to two people or things and one another refers to more than two people or things. We call these phrases reciprocal pronouns. Here's an example with each other. The two animals looked at each other. And here's an example with one another. Family members usually like one another. Today, this rule is disappearing and for good reason. Respected dictionaries, such as the American Dictionary Merriam-Webster, seem to think it has always been nonsense. Merriam-Webster writes that good writers have used each other and one another interchangeably since at least the 16th century. Others agree. In their book, Longman Guide to English Usage, British grammar experts Janet Whitcutt and Sidney Greenbaum write that there is no basis for the rule. So, unless told otherwise, you can use each other and one another interchangeably in any writing situation. While these three grammar rules have strange beginnings and are disappearing from modern English, it is important to know the writing style of your workplace, school, or university. If you are ever unsure about current opinion on a grammar rule, the safest thing to do is to use it. I'm Alice Bryant. America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Millard Fillmore, the 13th President of the United States. Fillmore is also likely the least remembered president. He has been called uninspiring and having only some competence. But Fillmore provided an example of the American dream come true. He rose from a poor family to become a wealthy man. He was elected to Congress four times and nominated for vice president under Zachary Taylor. When Taylor unexpectedly died in office in 1850, Fillmore took his place. Other presidents' campaigns, such as Andrew Jackson's, had spoken proudly of their candidates' modest beginnings. William Henry Harrison's supporters especially linked him with the image of a simple house called a log cabin, even though William Henry Harrison was a wealthy man. 
But Millard Fillmore really was born in a log cabin. His family was poor. They raised him and his seven brothers and sisters in a rural part of New York State. Fillmore did not receive much education as a child. However, he was very interested in learning, so interested that he fell in love with his teacher, Abigail Powers. The two married after he launched his career as a lawyer. They had two children, a son and a daughter. Millard Fillmore soon entered politics. He won elections to the New York State Assembly and then to the U.S. House of Representatives. After eight years in Washington, D.C., Fillmore returned to New York. He failed to be elected governor, but succeeded to become comptroller of New York. In other words, he oversaw the state's finances. At that time, Americans were preparing for another presidential election. President James Polk was retiring from the White House after only one term, as he had promised. The opposition party, the Whigs, nominated Zachary Taylor as their presidential candidate. Taylor, a popular war hero from the South, owned slaves but the Whigs realized that many anti-slavery voters in the North would not support Taylor. Party leaders were looking for someone to balance the ticket. A Northerner, voters would consider a friend of business. They found Millard Fillmore. In 1847, the Whigs nominated Fillmore as Taylor's vice president. The two men had never met, and when they did meet, they did not like each other very much. Taylor was short-legged, poorly educated, and rarely seemed concerned about his physical appearance. Fillmore was taller, learned, and elegant. Their personalities did not fit together any better than their appearances did but a majority of voters liked them. The Whigs won the election, and Fillmore returned to Washington. As vice president, Millard Fillmore was the leader of the Senate. But President Taylor did not seek his advice on the major political issue of the day. At the time, both lawmakers and the public were debating whether the government should and could ban slavery in the territories the U.S. had gained after the war with Mexico. In general, Northerners did not want to permit slavery in new states, but many Southerners did. The debate was so heated that one of the Southern states, South Carolina, threatened to leave the Union. President Taylor did not want to expand slavery. To restrict it, he proposed a change to the rules so California and New Mexico could enter the Union quickly as slave-free states. But before Taylor's idea could get too far, he became sick. Fillmore learned the president was not well and prepared for the worst. It came. Taylor died after being in office for only 16 months. The following day, Fillmore was sworn in as president. One of Fillmore's first acts as president was to show where he stood on the slavery issue. He appointed a man who opposed Taylor to Secretary of State. 
That man, Daniel Webster, and others, wanted to pass a compromise bill on slavery. With Fillmore's support, they succeeded. The Compromise of 1850 included several measures related to slavery. Two measures limited it. California was admitted as a free state, and the slave trade in Washington, D.C. ended. On the other hand, New Mexico and Utah were left open to slavery, and both the federal government and ordinary citizens were required to return suspected escaped slaves to their owners. That last measure, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, targeted even free African Americans and enslaved people who had escaped to free states. The Compromise aimed to end the conflict between pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces, but neither side was really satisfied, and President Fillmore did not help matters. He was personally opposed to slavery. However, he did not act on his beliefs. Instead, he tried to keep the South in the Union by strongly enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act. By the end of Fillmore's three years in the White House, many members of his Whig party were angry with him. Party leaders did not nominate him again for the next election. But their chosen candidate was not successful either. Fillmore turned out to be the last Whig president. The end of Fillmore's presidency included difficulty in his private life, too. His wife, Abigail, became sick on the day the next president was sworn in. She died within a month. Soon after, Fillmore's daughter died, too. To help deal with their loss, Fillmore tried to stay active in politics. In the presidential election of 1856, Fillmore served as the candidate for a new party, the Know Nothing Party. The Know Nothings were strongly opposed to immigration. They especially wanted to limit the number of Irish Catholics who could come to the United States. Fillmore did not agree with the party's anti-immigration policies but he did not have a chance to put his opinions into policy. Fillmore finished third out of the three major candidates in the election. After that loss, he finally retired to the city of Buffalo, New York. There, Fillmore married a second time to a wealthy widow named Carolyn McIntosh. He remained an important figure in the city's charities and other causes. But the political situation in the country grew only more intense. Americans continued to be divided over the issue of slavery. Fillmore's time in office and his compromise bill may have delayed but did not stop the American Civil War. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 